What do we do about it? Harvard political scientists Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziplot are two of the country's foremost experts on democracies and the forces that can either keep them alive or, quite frankly, break them. Back in 2018, when the nation was just entering the second year of the Trump administration, they wrote an incredibly oppression book called How Democracies Die. And in the book, those two Harvard political scientists recognized the incipient signs of democratic decay in America. And they compared it to some of the same patterns that have played out in other countries around the world. Countries where the grand experiment of democratic governance had failed. And despite the somewhat gloomy title of their book, they urged, you know, they oozed with knowledge and insight to come up with ways to stop American society from actually sliding into this authoritarianism, to head off what they had seen happen in places where democracy actually fell apart. And President Biden has reportedly been citing their work since he was a candidate back in 2020. This week, Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer invited the authors to present their work to Democratic caucus, uh, to the Democratic caucus, to illustrate the urgency of passing voting rights legislation to address growing threats to democracy. The final chapter of their book is titled Saving Democracy, and it feels more relevant now than ever. Joining us now is Daniel Ziblatt, Harvard professor, political scientist, and one of the aforementioned authors of the book, How Democracies Die. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us, uh, Daniel. I greatly appreciate your time. Your book ends uh, with several steps to avert the collapse of democracy in America, but I have to note, as I did, it was written in 2018. Given what we have seen in the intervening years since that book came out, is it too late to take the steps that you outlined? Yeah, thank you for having me. It's not too late, uh, but I do have to say, when we wrote the book, we were very nervous and we were worried that Donald Trump showed all of the indicators of demagogues we had studied in other parts of the world. But one of the things that's really changed over the last several years that we've grown to realize the problem is not about a single leader and his cults, as sometimes people describe it. Rather, has it's much more endemic, much deeper, much broader. And really, the problem today in the United States is that the Republican Party has been taken over by the MAGA faction, as it's sometimes called, essentially is behaving as an authoritarian party, much more similar to parties like the BJP in India, Fidesz, the party in Hungary that, uh, that Donald Trump just endorsed in upcoming elections. Yeah. Uh, and the AKP in Turkey. So it's behaving as a much more authoritarian party, and so the problem's much more widespread than it was in 2018. Two of the things that you say can help avert a democratic collapse, which I think are very interesting because it's so timely, are supporting broadly popular bread-and-butter economic policies, um, and at the same time promoting racial inclusivity in democratic participation. And I say it's timely because it seems like this is exactly what the Biden administration was trying to do, both with Build Back Better and voting rights. But as we see, they both have stalled in Congress. So is there a way, in your opinion, that we could overcome that? Yeah, I think that the Biden administration had the plan that by addressing the material conditions of, of Americans, this would improve people's lives and it would take some of the anger and, and, and the rage that has uh, permeated American politics, out of American politics. And, you know, we have to give the Biden administration credit. They, they have, were quite successful in their first year. The Build Back Better plan didn't succeed. Uh, that was plan A. I think plan B was to address these voting rights concerns, because it, it, no matter how much you address the underlying economic conditions of people's lives, if the rules of the game are rigged and unfair, and I think increasingly we see since the January 6th uh, rejection of the election results, an effort by Republicans to rig the rules at the state level, then it doesn't matter. It, it, Democrats can't, you know, it makes it much more difficult to win. So I think there's really serious efforts underway to combat that. I don't think we should throw in the towel. I mean, as difficult as this week has been, you know, I have students uh, who sometimes, you know, think they're not going to do well on exam, so then they don't study for the exam, and then they don't do well on the exam. And that's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think American society right. should, should not fall uh, victim to this kind, of self, this kind of doom and gloom. I mean, we, there's a lot of work to do, and we have a, a short amount of time to do it. As I mentioned in the setup, I know that you, you know, you can't talk specifically about your briefing to Democratic senators this week on the threats to democracy, but to pick up on your analogy here about a self-fulfilling prophecy, did you get a sense from speaking to them that they understand the threats to democracy uh, in general? Did it seem like they agreed with you about what's at stake and where we are uh, as a country in this moment? 
you know, we made really the argument that uh, the threats to democracy today are not, you know, military coups and attacks on Congress is as serious as those are, but much more uh, politicians, elected politicians in suits, men and women, changing the rules of the game to assault democracy. And I, and I think I think the Democratic senators understand that. Um, the, the question is, do, do, is it worth changing the filibuster over this? We tried to make the case that it is, that the risks facing our democracy are greater than the risks of altering the status quo of the filibuster. And I guess the, the problem at this point is not all the Democratic senators are committed to this. But we should not lose sight of the fact, in your, in your setup, you said there's two Democratic senators who are, who are blocking this, and that, that's right. But let's also remember there are 50 Republican senators who won't even talk about these issues. And that's ultimately, right. at the end of the biggest barrier. No, and that's an absolutely good point. I'm glad that you uh, you remind us and our viewers that the only reason we're in this situation is because we have 50 Republicans who are not even willing to engage a debate, and in fact, in, in some cases, perhaps even contributing uh, to the suppression of voters in this country. Uh, Daniel Ziblatt, co-author of the book, How Democracies Die. It was a real pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, and still ahead here tonight, why the fear